Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. Today's guest is Brandy Benson. That's right, Brandy Benson, Brandy with two eyes. Uh, she is the author of The Enemy Inside Me, A Young Soldier's Unexpected Battle with Cancer. Brandy shares, uh, she had a one in a billion shot of being diagnosed with this cancer, of, of getting this cancer and then being diagnosed with it. And uh, she shares with us her journey, her $3 million journey. It's the, all the chemo and the surgeries and uh, medical bills rack up very quickly. And uh, <laughs> but Brandy shares with, us, shares with us how to get, how she got that taken care of because I know a lot of you right now are struggling with medical bills and other bills and it seems overwhelming and we don't realize how much help is out there for us and, and how many programs there are. So Brandy is here to share how she got that $3 million covered. Um, Brandy is also a sought after speaker. And as I said, she is a cancer survivor and proud war veteran. She is an Iraqi war veteran. So she's, she's as she says in the episode, she checks all the boxes. And we'll talk about what that is in reference to in the episode. I also want to take this time for thanking you for sharing the episodes, for rating it five stars, for leaving comments. Remember, you can contact me directly if you're on social media, Instagram. I'm LeoFlowers2000 on Instagram. Uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, if you're on Twitter, I'm LeoFlowers for real. So you can go there and message me. Or you can email me at LeoFlowers2000 at Gmail with any questions, concerns, thoughts, uh, and, and feedback. I, I'm always open to receiving you feedback because um, I'm, I'm just – the podcast is growing immensely and we've reached over a hundred thousand downloads, which I never thought was conceivable. So I really want to take this time to thank you, the listener. And if you have not yet go to thrive with Leo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours. Truly. If you're struggling with uh, feelings of guilt, imposter syndrome, shame, if there's some type of childhood traumas or tragedies or even conflict resolution, if you're in a relationship uh, and you're struggling with communicating or feeling heard, go to thrivewithleo.com, and let's get to tomorrow together. With that said, let's jump into the episode. Here is Brandy Benson. Well, I know that you are an Iraqi war veteran. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your service. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, is part of your move to Miramar uh, a mental health strategy? Because I know that uh, being in nature, the outdoors, that's something that um, is so beneficial to reducing our anxiety, keeping our cortisol levels low, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I wouldn't say that that was the main reason, because in Savannah, there's tons of trails and there's places to like do little small little hiking things. So there's lots of nature. I think there's more nature in the area I came from versus over here. This is a lot more, I don't know, like industrialized, um, a lot more homes. There's not much land, um, but there, but the beaches over here, but there was also a beach in uh, the Savannah area that I lived in, but we moved because we wanted more opportunities and a bigger city and, I was just so tired of staying in Savannah. I'd been there for 11 years and I felt like I had grown out of the city. So it was just time for me to branch to something uh, newer with a uh, bigger territory. It was more for like networking. So how, you know, for so many people right now, because of the, the pandemic and the quarantine, they're forced to move, relocate. And a lot of people are afraid to do that because they have to start all over, especially socially, right? Like you talked about networking. Mm -hmm. How, how did you, you know, uh, introduce yourself to the, the new environment, make new friends and, and especially now when everybody has a mask on and we got to stand six <laughs> feet apart, like, you know, what, what was your strategy for that? Uh, so I grew up moving around a lot. Every three years growing up from the time I was five to, to now, we would move every three years. And it wasn't because we were in the military at the time. We just 
would always move. So my stepdad would get promotions or my mom would get a job somewhere and we'd go to a bigger area or um, a nicer area or yeah, like a nicer area. <clears throat> we would go there. And so every three years we'd kind of bounce around and move around. And then when I joined the military, because I had come from a background with moving around and uh, jumping from place to place and being used to like leaving a foundation that I've grown into or, you know, made friends and well-known in the community was an easy transition. So moving from one state to the next state was really exciting, but it was very uh, difficult because a lot of things were closed. Um, uh, we had like a moving company that would, you know, came and wanted to help, but then they weren't too sure because, you know, we don't want to spread any germs and the coronavirus. So it was, had its own little headaches and issues, but Overall, um, it was pretty easy. It wasn't anything too hard. Basically, again, because I've moved my entire life so many times from being in the army. Right. So for you to be in one place for too long, you kind of get antsy. Like that's more. Oh my gosh! Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Exactly. So when I stayed in Savannah for the eleven years that I was there, I was like, oh my gosh. I've been here for so long. I'm ready for a change. I'm ready to, you know, try something new. I'm ready to explore. Um, but I kept getting stuck in that area. And thank goodness, you know, time was um, finally on my side and it was time for me to to move and go to another area. So I'm just really grateful to um, be in a bigger city and, and uh, be here. It's a huge, huge, huge melting pot. And I love that about Florida. Yeah, because it sounds like you, you have uh, some ethnicity in you besides Savannah, Georgia. Where, where are your parents from? Uh, so my mother is from um, Southern California. And then my biological father, he was born in France. He's a military kid. Uh, so we're not going to say he's from France, but he was born in France. And he's also from California. Got you. So, you're, so both parents are black then? Is that, but he was just a black dude born in France? <laughs> Black dude. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, so he, yes, he is a black dude. Um, he ended up passing away about 20 years ago. And my mother is, she is Hispanic and Native American and white. Wow. So mm -hmm. what box do you check? All of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All of them, because I can. I can. And then I, I like when they have the option that says I'm um, one or two races, one or two races or something like that, or one or two more races. I always check that as well. But I do. I'm black. I'm white. I'm Hispanic. I have Native American in me. I have Chinese in me. So I check them all. Okay. So are, do you have <laughs> dual citizenship? No, I don't. Oh, mm -hmm. are you working? Tell no. me you're working on that. Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Come, on. Come on. You got all that going on? I, I yeah. only bring it up because my mom is from Belize and I just learned that um, I can apply for, you know, dual citizenship uh, in Belize. Really? And then with that, I also get a plot of land. Uh, what? It's, it's wow. Of, yeah, it's like part of the, the birthright. So that's why, you know, a, a lot of people don't know that because they are multi-ethnic or especially if they have uh, if they're, one of their parents is from somewhere, you know, uh, outside the country, they can apply for citizenship. And then with that comes all these other perks that you wow. otherwise would not be able to get here in America. But nobody's going to tell you that. Like, it's, it's, it's some homework you, you got to do. And a lot of family members, you know, just don't know. Well, I never knew that. I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, I have a cousin who was telling me some stuff about, you have like a certain percentage of, some specific tribe, a Native American, you are entitled to, you know, some, I don't know if it's land, but you're entitled to something. So I need to look into that as well. I just, I don't know if it's like a large enough portion, but well, I'll have to, I have to look into that. That's a good idea. Yeah. You I know, just wrote it. I just wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because the, the, the other cool thing is, have you done a 23 and me? I have, process? I have, I have, I have. Yes, I am 46% African American and 42% uh white and then some other you know other um other things as well like the Native American and Chinese and something else it was like Greece or something but yeah I did I definitely did it's so interesting 
Super interesting. Well, I was asking because, you know, you were diagnosed with a rare aggressive form of cancer. And I was yes. wondering if through that 23andMe, it, it alluded to it or it shed some light as to uh, maybe why you, uh, uh, you know, were no. struck with it. So, yeah. Okay. So maybe it wasn't 23andMe. I did the ancestry or the... Okay. Is that is that the same thing? Are it's pretty the much the same thing. Yeah, they're, they're okay. both looking. Yeah, so I just it, it didn't really tell me like any diseases I was going to have or, or if I would have any in the future. Kind of just alluded to the fact that the white side of my family came from Canada and France, and then um, most of the African American community that I'm from uh, or my family they came from like Alabama and Louisiana, but. I did find out that I'm related to Nat Turner. <laughs> yep. Found wow. out to Nat Turner and Anita Hill. Mm-hmm. What? Come on. Yeah. I know. It's not cool. I mean, the Nat Turner was like super crazy to find that out, but I still, I'm like, wow, that's, that's interesting. Well, it, it, it especially depends on like what you were doing when you found out, like, you know, like, were, were you like just lounging on the couch? Like, what's the meaning <laughs> of life? And then you're like, oh, Nat Turner, I got Nat Turner. I got to get up and do something, you know? Oh, no, I was just like, wow, you know, definitely not trying to rustle any like crazy feathers anywhere. But yeah, so I ended up looking it up and found it out, I reached out to my aunt who uh, who actually knew about it. And she I guess they kind of feel like it's not that, like they might be ashamed of it kind of, like they don't really want to tell people about it. So she was kind of being like, it was a secret. And I'm like, oh my God, like, tell me what happened. How, how, how are we related to this guy? This is amazing. And then and I started watching the show because I originally didn't know too much about him. I just knew he was, you know, pretty, you know, um, a rebel, we'll say. And uh, that's all I knew. So I watched, there was like some show that I watched in 2018 about it. And I was like, oh, I see. Okay. (laughs) I see why she was like, oh, being a little hesitant about claiming him as family. Got it. Yeah, there's there's so much about his story. And, And, you know, the thing is, is I feel like every 10, 20 years, the story kind of changes. Like they add mm-hmm. some stuff, they take some things away. So it'll be interesting to see, mm-hmm. you know, how they portray them, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, mm, that's true. Today. So, <laughs> but you, so could you tell us more about this uh, aggressive form of cancer that you had? How old were you and, and how did you, uh, you know, manage that? So I got diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma cancer, which is very rare and aggressive cancer. About 12,000 people nation worldwide will get this type of cancer, Ewing sarcoma. About 6,000 of them transition and they'll pass away. And about 3,000 of them will make it past the five-year mark. So I'm at my 12-year mark. I made it. I'm super happy and excited about that. Um, but so I was diagnosed in 2009 and I was in Iraq when I found out about the cancer. So I was deployed And I was just feeling really lethargic. I was exhausted. I was really tired. And I literally felt like every day that I drank like six bottles of NyQuil or something. Like I was so tired. It just exhausted beyond belief. And that was one of the attributing factors to having Ewing sarcoma cancer. And I had no clue of what it was. So like the signs and symptoms that I was experiencing at first was just extreme fatigue. And then about th- two or three weeks later, after feeling just not normal and really tired, a tumor popped up in my left inner groin muscle. And um, so then I had to travel all around the world trying to figure out what exactly was going on with me. I went from um, Iraq, which I, so I was in Iraq, and Diwania is what it's called. It's 86 miles south of Baghdad. So I went from there to Baghdad. Then from Baghdad to Germany. And from Germany, I went to Walter Reed Medical Center, which was located at the time in Washington, D.C. And then that's where I started all of my treatment and got everything um, together. I did 102 rounds of chemotherapy in about 10 months. I did treatment for five days on, eight days off, five days on, and eight days off. And I continued that the entire duration. I had a huge, huge, huge surgery that was about 13 or 14 hours long. They removed my entire adductor muscle out of my leg. 
Uh, so which meant that I would not be able to, you know, run or jump or sprint or do any of the normal quote unquote things that I used to be able to do. So I had to learn how to walk again and, uh, you know, figure out what I could and couldn't do because I was missing this massive portion out of my leg due to having the cancer. Um, but yeah, so it was, it's been about 12 years since all of that. And life has been, uh, it's been great. You know, it took a long time to really accept, you know, the fact that this happened to me and, you know, that I look different now and having a more positive outlook on it rather than feeling sorry for myself like I did in the beginning. Yeah, I can't even imagine, you know, for something like that to happen so young. Here you are, you join the military, you're young, you're robust. You're, you're, I mean, this is when we're at our apex physically, mm-hmm. right? Yes, and yes. And for something like that to hit you, there's also the, like, you don't want to let everybody else down, right? Like the, the, your, the your, your sisters, your brothers, the, the, the people that you are in battle with. Like you, you, you're like, no, I can, I can fight this. And so that's kind of what's pushing you, I would imagine, in the beginning. Yeah, I just, I just, I couldn't believe that it was happening. So again, with sarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, this, that type of cancer happens to um, young boys. So for, so it's young, they're young children from like six to 14. So that made me feel like, you know, I don't know if this is correct or not. Then it happens to Caucasian little boys. So I am in my 20s, like almost late 20s, I'm 24. I am African-American and I'm a woman. So when I was, when they initially told me what the diagnosis was, I was kind of like, I don't know if that's correct. So I was in denial for quite some time because how could this be? I don't fit the profile of what it is that they're saying that I have. That completely makes sense. And then you're like, and then I would imagine you're kind of feeling like, like, what did you do to deserve this? There's oh my of, gosh, right? no, <laughs> yes, yes. And I kept thinking, oh my God, you know, I was, of course I was crying. I was sad. I was depressed. I felt hopeless. All the feelings of being overwhelmed and, you know, pity for myself and sorry for myself. And I literally thought, oh my God, this must be like my karma. Like I have been such a terrible person. <laughs> Like this is, this has to be the reason why this is happening and that my mother's going to watch me die. My sister's going to watch me die. Like I just, I was so distraught. I was so upset, but I literally thought that I had done something to deserve this at first. At first I thought that it was like my fault. Like I brought it onto myself somehow, which is not true of course, but that's how I was feeling. Years well, you, ago. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I was just talking to a friend the other day about, you know, I went to a Catholic school as a kid and, uh, and Catholic guilt is real, even though I'm not Catholic, you know, mm-hmm. you're still receiving the messages of good and bad. And, uh, the downside of one of the messages is that, um, uh, when you're good, good things happen to you. When you're bad, bad things happen mm-hmm. to you. What, re- what religion mm-hmm. were you raised in and, and how did that play? Uh, Christianity. So I definitely thought I had done something wrong. Like you treat people with respect, you treat them good, and you know whatever you give out, you're gonna be get, you're gonna be receiving that. And so I just thought maybe I was being a bad person. Maybe, um, you know, I just I couldn't f- understand why it was happening. And then I didn't know that cancer could sh- drug at any time. I thought cancer had happened to people who were older, much older, or they were very um, unhealthy and they smoked and they drank and they had really bad habits. So I was at the top of my game. I'm really in shape. I'm I'm really young. I'm healthy, and I, I'm a great person. I'm not going to brag or anything, but I was, you know, I mean, I am, and I was a pretty uh, selfless individual. So for this to happen to me, I just I couldn't understand why it was happening. Then I was questioning God, and uh, you know, thinking like I must have just been a terrible person, and I'm being punished, and this is my karma, and this is what I get, you know, because. I don't know. I, I was really just trying to make sense of everything and, and, and wondering why it was happening to me. And if there is a God, like, why would God let this happen to me? And not only me, but my family, my family has to watch me go through this. And there, you know, this is trauma for them as well. Absolutely. Be- because they're worried about you. And there's also a financial component to all this. It's not just a you know, we didn't just lose an adductor. We about to lose some money over this. I, you know, I can't imagine. 
I can't imagine the financial <laughs> stress that uh, that compounded everything else that was going on. Yeah. So with that, so when you're in the military and you get something wrong or you're sick or something happens, they cover the costs. So my treatment <clears throat> rounded up to about $3 million. I had uh, surgeries. I had seven surgeries that year. I had endless amounts of chemotherapy. I had, um, uh, what else did I get done? I had different uh, psychology and uh, different appointments. I had a dietitian. I had physical therapy. I had everything in the book you can name to like bring me back to optimal health. But all that was paid for and all of that was covered because I was in the military. So we didn't have to feel the burden of the um, financial distress or anything like that. But for those that I, so I just started uh, uh, finding this out about maybe last year sometime that when individuals do get sick with cancer, that different hospitals have endowment funds. And those funds are for people who can't afford their treatment or they, they don't have uh, medical coverage or insurance. So you go to the hospital, you ask them about the endowment fund that they might have, and nine times out of 10, they will, and your treatment will be covered the entire, the entire way. You know, I had that experience when I, I went in and I didn't have insurance and they said that the hospital had uh, some reserve funds for people who could right? afford it. And they, and they hooked the brother up. I was like, what? Right? Let's it's, go. Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. amazing. That I was like, amazing. while we're here, let's and look at my knee. I was like, let's look at everything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. And I feel like they people should advocate that. People need to tell people there's these resources out there that, that uh, you don't have to die of cancer or die of any disease or whatever it is, that there's these programs that have money reserved specifically for this event, for these individuals. I just, I didn't know anything about it until last year, but now that I do, I make sure I tell all of my friends and anybody that reaches out to me about having cancer or sarcoma and they don't have insurance, I, I definitely let them know that there is some resources and monies available to them. You know, I, I've, I've come to realize that rich people are rich, not just because they make money, but because they know where the free money is. Yeah. They, know, they know all of these loopholes and, and endowment mm-hmm. funds and 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 they don't have no problem asking for it. No, no, but it's 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 so true. If you if you knew better, you would do better. But if you don't know anything and you don't know what questions to ask or where to start, it's kind of like you're you're just going to be at the bottom the whole time because you you're just not aware of yeah. what your rights are. And it's too bad that it's like that. But if we just continue to spread the information and the message, it will get to the right people. So you talked about uh, having a dietitian and psychologist. Tell us, uh, please share with us, like, what were some of the, the dietary uh, protocols that uh, you had to undergo? And then uh, and how and what are some of those things that you're still sticking with today? And then take us through the, the mental health journey of, like, what, what were some of the, the protocols and strategies the, psych, the psychologist uh, used with you? All right. So for the dietitian things, I had to stay away for, this is what they were um, having me do. Um, I had to stay from, stay away from raw foods. So anything like fruits that were anything that was not cooked, I was not allowed to eat it. Um, They gave me a lot of um, cooked like steaks, cooked meat, uh, um, cooked anything that was cooked. So I couldn't have any yogurt. I couldn't have any uh, like um, um, uncooked vegetables or fruits or anything like that. And I was just until I was finished with my treatment. And that was because if a, uh, like a foreign substance or foreign, you know, bug or something happens and it's on this piece of lettuce that I eat or on this uh, strawberry that I eat and it gets into my body because I was a neutropenic, which means that your counts are extremely low. Any common cold that you could usually fight off would kill you. So they were really just trying to make sure that I wasn't eating or introducing any new bacteria into my body that my body could not fight off and didn't have the like strength to fight off. So that's what I had to do uh, the entire time I was at the hospital. So they really made sure I ate um, a cooked meal um, the entire time I was there. I couldn't have anything raw, nothing, no fruits. And then I also couldn't even have any like flowers in my room. 
Um, it wasn't allowed to have any, any flowers either. So no flowers, no plants, none of that. And then now that I'm healthier, I'm able, and my body is stronger. I definitely, I don't eat any meat at all. Don't eat any meats. I don't eat any dairy. And um, I eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, <laughs> cooked and uncooked. But so that's definitely that's something that's changed from there. And then from like a mental, uh, ca- mental health capacity, I had a psychiatrist that I would speak to uh, at least at least once a week. So at first when I was doing it, I kind of was embarrassed about it. Um, I didn't want to talk to her about anything. And I felt like it was a waste of time. And then as time was going on, I kind of looked forward to talking to her. And then I was more open about what was going on with me and my feelings and really understanding the value and communicating your feelings and what's going on and um, having information fed back into you that is from a um, educated point of view. So I started really to value that. And then I continued that after the uh, all the treatment, and the chemotherapy and the cancer and all of that, I still talk to a, a psychologist till this day because I need to, it's just, you know, I feel like it's, it's good for me mentally. Uh, you know, mental health wise, it's something that I feel like it's beneficial for me now. All right. There's so much I want to unpack here. I want to go back to the okay. part because and, uh-huh. I want to clarify in that, you know, as you were going through chemo, uh, you couldn't have anything that was raw, no, no dairy, mm-hmm. uh, no yogurt. You couldn't even have plants in the room, but you, you were able to eat steaks. So steaks, uh, was it mostly red meat then, or was it just uh, so any cooked they, meat? Any cooked meat. So, but I would just eat steaks because my body was like, I was like yearning for it. Every time I would get off this certain chemotherapy, I don't remember. I think it was like doxyrubin is what it's called. And they call it the red devil in the cancer community. Um, so I was on the red devil. After I finished that one, it was like the strongest chemotherapy. It made me hallucinate. I would see things. I would see dead people. I would talk to like people that weren't there. And I was just like totally out of my mind. But after I, that one, I would need, like, I want steak, like tons of steak. So I would just eat for my, whatever I was craving, I would eat that, but excluding, you know, uh, the fresh fruits and vegetables and, and yogurt and stuff like that. Okay. And then what, what I, I guess what I'm finding fascinating is that it was the red meat and the steaks that uh, got you through it. And then when you got healthy, you're like, no meat, no dairy. Yeah. So talk us through that, through that thought process. Okay. So as I've healed, I've just realized that um, like the optimal health for me or what I've done some research on are the, the plants or vegetables or meats, whatever that has the most enzymes inside of them, the most nutritional value in it. And that would be something in its raw form, right? So you would eat like uh, some broccoli, but if you cook it too much, you diffuse the properties, you lose the nutritional values and you lose all the properties for what you're consuming, you know, for the benefits nutritional wise. And so when you also, when you eat a steak, like you're, it's dead flesh. There's a dead piece of meat. There's not much nutritional value that I've done research on versus something like, you know, fruits and vegetables and a plant-based lifestyle and meal. So I just kind of took that out. And then it's also linked to different, you know, heart disease and diabetes. And it's just, I just feel like if I cleaned up my diet myself and from all the research that I've done myself, because I'm not a doctor, not a nutrition, um, that I would feel better and I would um, hopefully make it past the five years. And that's initially why I did it. I just wanted to get rid of any toxins that were sitting in my body for too long because also to some research on when you eat large portions of meat, like it takes like 18 days or something for it to um, digest through the intestines and, you know, to use the bathroom to to excrete it out. And so if some dead flesh and dead meat is just sitting in your body, just sitting there and every single day you have meat with your, with every meal, that's just, you know, kind of like backs you up a bit. So, so, you know, it's just, I don't want colon cancer and I I just want to eat as healthy as I can for myself. But that's the only reason why nobody told me to do this. I just, that's my personal preference. And, And the reason why it's just, 
uh, it makes me feel better. <clears throat> well, I appreciate you sharing that. And for the listeners out there, know that uh, this is not like, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, no one's advocating a certain diet. Like as as right. Andy shared, it's like, it's what makes you feel better and what ma- feels good for mm-hmm. you. Because I eat red meat. I had red meat for, for <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I'm, I'm eating right. lamb, goat. All the things. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's really about finding the thing that, that works for you. So I appreciate you sharing Exactly. That. Right. Um, and so when we get to the, now, well, last question in regards to that, how was that conversation with your family? Because, you know, growing up in, in Georgia, that's the South. I mean, mm-hmm. there ain't a lot of uh, vegetarians uh, or people eating a plant-based diet in the South. Uh, you know, how was that conversation with your family? Uh, So I didn't grow up in Georgia. I grew up in California, but I ended up in uh, the Georgia area because I was stationed at Fort Stewart, which is in, yeah, which is in Hinesville, Georgia. However, um, so I, after I had, you know, kind of readjusted my diet and my um, lifestyle of eating and exercising and all of that, I was already, that was kind of the entry point to, um, to that. So I started in 2011 and it happened. And I think I got stationed in Georgia in 2011. Yeah. So 2011 is when I uh, stopped eating the red meat and the chicken and turkey and all that stuff. So, but it was really hard. It was really hard to give up because, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different. I feel like they're less health conscious, quote unquote, uh, than they are over here um, in the Florida area. Like Florida, there's tons of uh, vegan options and tons of plant-based foods and over there it's not as uh, popular um it's it's getting better but it's not as it's not as popular as it is um over here for sure oh yeah because you got also that that cuban influence and uh you know plantains and you know plantains. Fruits and <laughs> You're hilarious. It. it's all about the plantains yeah <laughs> yeah they got a lot of yeah and so it's like a it's very tropical here so there's lots of fruits and there's vegetables people are a lot more active here a lot more um i don't want to say they're vain i just they're just they care about how they look a lot more here than they did when i was living in savannah like people are at they're at the gym over here they are like dressed head to toe makeup everything on i'm like wow this is crazy but they they're in shape you know they're their hair looks luxurious. I'm like, well, this is completely different than where I came from. But, you know, I love it. I think it's, it's great. I, oh, I love it here. The hair is luxurious. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's the, it is. It's like, I'm t- they, they just look amazing here. It's like, wow. You know, it's just, it's, it's total, total different um, culture than uh, the, the uh, Southern Savannah area, Georgia area. It's a lot of Latinas here. A lot of, it's really spicy. <laughs> oh, real? Yeah, yeah. A lot of flavor. Mm-hmm. A, lot, a lot of gesturing with the hands. A lot mm-hmm. of, a lot, a lot of yes. So, I mean, yes. which I would imagine may have helped uh, the emotional process because you talked about going to therapy to uh, express your emotions and mm-hmm. share your feelings. And, you know, when I think about the Latin, the Latin culture, they're, they're very expensive. <laughs> they have no problem sharing all the feels with you <laughs> that's so true that's so true but i haven't made too many friends out here just because of the pandemic and things are going on so i'm not really talking to too many people but you know i, I can i see them talking with their hands <laughs> of so, course so what are some of those <clears throat> strategies because so many people are struggling in relationships and friendships or uh in terms of communicating uh emotionally when you when you talk about that, give us an example of of what that looks like. It you know, uh, expressing your emotions or getting in touch with it. Were there some strategies or tools that the, the therapist gave you? Uh, yeah. So journaling uh, has really helped, and I still keep a journal. Um, I keep a journal for uh, when I was at this like dark place, or because I was not very happy with how I looked because I, after chemotherapy and treatment and all that, like you've been, I've been stripped away of like all of my physical health, what I look like, my identity. So I kind of now I'm just this, you know, really sick individual and I feel really weak. But so she uh, had me have a, 
a gratitude journal. So I write down what I'm grateful for and um, just what I was going through and just writing down how I was feeling. So I always say, if you want to get out your emotions and you don't want to talk to somebody, you can write it in a diary or a journal. You can uh, hire somebody, a psychiatrist to talk to. Um, and you don't have, maybe it could be telemedicine. Like it doesn't have to be in person. Maybe if they're um, not as open when they're in front of some people, because some people are, they don't feel comfortable with being vulnerable at all. So if you're over the phone, it's kind of like you still have something to like mask what's really going on, but you can still speak on what it is. Like they don't have to see you. So getting some therapy in, um, what else? Um, going outside, getting some exercise, moving around, having a clean diet. Um, you'd be so surprised to know that what you're eating and what you're drinking plays a huge impact on your mood and your like overall health. Uh, somebody who has a really poor, poor, poor diet, they, you know, they don't, uh, get good sleep. They're not exercising correctly. They're not involved in, um, uh, with communities or different sporting events and stuff like that. So just being aware of what you're consuming is also very important. So cleaning up your diet, uh, getting a journal, writing stuff down and speaking to somebody or even trying to belong to a community. Some people feel like, like I did at first when I was going through my cancer experience, that I was the only one in the world going through this, you know, sarcoma and there was nobody there. In hindsight, there was many programs that I could have reached out to. I just didn't know about them. Um, and that would have gave me a better sense of ease to let me know that, you know, I can beat this. And there are individuals that I can talk to that have been through similar situations that would let me just feel better just in general. And I wouldn't feel so alone. Um, so finding something to belong to and opening up is also really important as well, just to the health and mental well-being and the, like the survivorship and those resources really helped me uh, along the way. And I still use them. Yeah, I, I can tell how important community is to you and, and connecting with others are to you. Is that part of why you joined uh, the military? Because that's, that's not, uh, you know, it's an atypical move for, for most women. Yeah, I, so, so growing up, I was extremely athletic. I played on Olympic, de the Olympic developing programs. I played on AAU, CYO, select teams for basketball and soccer and stuff. And uh, so growing up, my goal was to play on some sort of collegiate level or maybe for the Olympics or some sort of something. I want to play on like a grand scheme uh, platform with a some sort of sport. So I joined the military, of course, to defend my country was the first one. But the second reason was to play on the all-American team. So I joined the military to join a team, to play on the team, to make the team. And um, I had spoke to one of the coaches that were there. And, you know, I kind of did like a little baby tryout with them and, you know, kind of like made it on the team. But I wasn't able to fulfill that because my unit had just got deployed. So I was instructed to come back after my deployment was over. <clears throat> so joining the military just allowed me to kind of like another chance to kind of live up my dreams with playing um, a professional sport, I guess you can say. So my process was uh, playing for my country. I like that. Playing for your country and fighting for your country. That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. That sounds like a book title right there. Oh, huh, that's a good idea. I'm writing a lot of stuff down. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're right. You know, jour journaling <laughs> every day. It's like at the end of my day, I like to journal, even if it's just, I think a lot of people shy away from it because uh, they have poor grammar or poor penmanship mm. or the spelling mm -hmm. is, is crap. And it's, it's really <laughs> just about getting what's in your head on paper so that it, it doesn't take up space that you could be mm -hmm. using for sleep, <laughs> you know? Yes, it's so true. <laughs> and then you also notice too, when you're writing these journals and you kind of read them back, you'll see like certain um, phrases or things that keep popping up. And you're like, okay, well then you can then like figure out what's really going on with these issues or why are you really feeling this? What's the root cause? Why do you keep... Uh, whatever they're writing, you know, whatever it's something about self-love or they don't love themselves or whatever the issue is. Like, why do you keep focusing on that? Why does this keep coming up? I just feel like it allows you to kind of dissect your feelings a bit more and understand yourself better. 
Yeah, you talk about uh, struggling with PTSD. Is that from the the cancer? Or is that from uh, the the you know being at going to war? You know, be, being in Iraq and, and losing people, or is it just a combination of the two? And what was that experience like for you? Uh, so it's from having the cancer, and I did not know. I thought PTSD was only those who went to war and came back and you know saw something dramatic or. Um, something like that. I didn't know that anybody could have PTSD. You can have PTSD from anything. Anything that you know alters you is traumatic to you and changes you is could be PTSD. So that's I got it from, uh, or I have it from cancer. So I would make friends with people on the ward, and each an individual person that was there, they would die. That just tore me up. The people that I would try to confide in. One minute they're okay, the next minute they're not. So I literally just watched people that I was close to just wither away one by one by one. So that really messed me up. And then just in life now, anytime I'm sick, I always think I have cancer again. And it's only because when I was diagnosed in 2009, uh, I was so like oblivious to it. I just, I was so naive. And so now I'm like, oh my God, it could be, you know, it could be something or, you know, my, my thumb is hurting. Oh my God. I I hope I don't have thumb cancer. Like just the craziest stuff all the time. But it's just, I went, I, you know, I was literally fighting for my life for those 10 months. And I, I just don't want to have to go through that again. So I just, I have to make sure that, um, I'm very aware, even if it's sometimes, you know, causing me, really bad PTSD or anxiety because I do take medication for it, but it's just part of the survivorship, you know? So I'm just glad to be alive. <laughs> right. So do you have a sleep protocol? Cause I know a lot of people who struggle with PTSD, it, it can wake them up or prevent them from going to sleep. Are there yeah. sleep routines that you have? Um, so I don't want to say sleep routine cause sometimes I don't follow it, but like I don't bring my electronics into the bedroom, stuff like that. I have, I had to go through a whole sleep hygiene process years ago. So they kind of taught me why I wasn't really sleeping well, but I do wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be sweating profusely. And, you know, I'll wake up and I think I have cancer again, or, um, uh, you know, or I have a f- like just weird, just strange dreams that basically sur- are surrounded with being sick and it reoccurring. Um, I have dreams like that all the time. All right. So we got to go through the sleep hygiene because a lot of people <laughs> out there don't know what they're doing um, that could be interfering with them getting a good night's sleep. So spare mm-hmm. the detail. What was, what, what did Marie Kondo do? And Marie Kondo. Well, this is what Marie Kondo did. Um, so you, of course you don't want to be drinking any alcohol before you go to bed. Um, you don't want to have an extremely full bladder where you have to keep getting up and going and use the restroom. Uh, they say that you're supposed to eat like two or three hours before you go to bed, but that doesn't work for me because I wake up starving all the time. Um, not having your electronics in the room. And they say to have the room like pitch black dark. And that's supposed to um, help. And it, it does, it helps me. But um, sometimes I am so thirsty or I'm so hungry and I can't, stick to those protocols because it's just impossible. Uh, I have to eat. So I, I eat all the time. Yeah. So the eating part and the not drinking any water for eight hours is impossible because I wake up thirsty. <laughs> so, but those are the, the, uh, the sleep hygiene things that they told me not to do. So no eating, no drinking alcohol, no having um, energy drinks, uh, throughout the day, like you're supposed to stop having them at like 12 o'clock so they can filter through your system. So by the time you are going to bed at like eight or nine, you've had at least nine hours for it to kind of filter through the kidneys and, and all of that. And you can flush it out. I love that. I appreciate you sharing that. I, yeah, I've stayed away from caffeine. Even if mm-hmm. I have a, a cup of green tea, it jacks me up for about two days. Really? Oh yeah. Wow. I can't have any, I'm too. I'm too. I'm sensitive. I'm. I'm very. Wow. Fragile. Oh yeah. I'm very fragile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't. I can't. None of that. I, wow. I, even like um, there's just certain TV shows like Narcos and Ozarks that that get your mm-hmm. heart rate going. I'm like, I can't do that. That's Not before true. Bedtime. I can That's only watch true. those before noon. 
That's true. That's so true. Yeah, watching what you watch at night. That's so yeah, true. I watch I watch kids <clears throat> I watch kids TV shows at night and then adult shows in the morning. That, I don't know. That is who, so funny. I don't know who thought to put it the opposite, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. So what kind of kids shows do you watch at night? Coco Melon? Come on now. Oh okay. Coco Melon Coco on, Melon. on Netflix, but you know what my favorite show is Scooby Doo. <laughs> Really? Oh, Scooby-Doo. 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 And then, you know, with the holidays, all, all the Charlie Brown, uh, yes, Christmas, Charlie Brown. Thanksgiving, all yes, of that. Yes. I'm here for all of it. So That is good stuff. But very nostalgic. To, very, uh, abs- that's exactly what it is. It's like, especially, you know, during this time where I can't go home and visit my family and, and, mm-hmm. and hang out with my friends the way I want to. Uh, you know, you get lonely. And so mm-hmm. to find those things, whether it's a, a uh, 80s playlist, R&B playlist. On I Spotify, love it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Jodeci, man. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, forever, my lady. <laughs> yes. Now I, now I can't hear this because, Come you know, copyright. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love them. The, now, <laughs> so let me ask you, speaking of Jodeci and, and slow jams, because I remember making those, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make this and give it to my girl. She going. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would have. Is there... Uh, having struggled with, uh, you know, going through cancer and then, you know, coming out of the war, what, or, uh, you know, coming out of the military, does it make relationships a bit more challenging or is Um, that, is that, is is a non-issue? Uh, I don't. Okay. So after surviving cancer, it has definitely changed me to the core of who I am and then how I deal with individuals. So therefore, yes, the relationships, it's made me value them a lot more. I feel like I have really um, like put a hyper focus in the people that I love and my friends and family. Like I'm, I always tell them how much they, they mean to me and I make sure I'm, you know, nice to them. And cause you never know what's going to happen. You don't know if someone's going to get a car accident tomorrow and you had a fight with that individual and they pass away or God forbid, somebody gets cancer and they're going through some sort of struggle and battle. So I always just try to make sure that I'm being the nicest that I can be, you know, of course with boundaries, but it's just made me so much nicer, so much more empathy and sympathy towards people because I definitely lacked that before I was uh, sick with cancer. Um, But from like a military standpoint, um, it's definitely made me uh, more aware of, uh, the, the diversity factor in life. And so I'm able to communicate with people from all different spectrums around the globe. Um, I'm able to work in different environments, different um, cultures. You know, I can, I feel like I'm, I'm more versatile when it comes to the workspace or the workplace than I was prior to joining. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think that a lot of people, um, don't realize that when we talk about culture, we're not just talking about black and white. We're talking about uh, socioeconomic culture. Exactly. East Coast, West Coast, you know, Catholic, yes. Jewish, like they're, they're mm-hmm. you know, hip hop, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I When I was growing up, it was uh, all the kids were wearing black and, and listening to uh, like, it was like not anthrax, but uh <laughs> but it was like you know it was just the the gothic uh you know style was in really? with, the, with the with the doc martens Ooh. the black doc martin boots and um yeah wow. you know wait, how old are you how old where are you, you? Where are you? i'm 36 where are you from i'm from chicago <laughs> oh okay okay yeah so Got you know it. rave uh uh rave music that was that was a big thing but i was an intel i was in i was i was like uh, very white Marvin Gaye. Uh, mm-hmm. So I was, I was, a, I was an old soul, John Coltrane. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. you had, this, you know, you got all these different, you got athletes and jocks and uh, the, the, right. the, the nerds, you know, it was just, there's so many different cultures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then also too, with the military. So it takes people who you would never associate with, like you're saying, like sharks and the, and the the bookworms and individuals like that. And you kind of push them all together. Right. So super rich individuals are coming. People who are extremely poor are coming in. P- 
people who are middle class to come in, but everybody's kind of forced to work together and to look out for each other because when you're out in the battlefield, all of that stuff doesn't matter anymore. You got my back, I got your back, and we have to come back together as a team to make it home. So it just makes you kind of just broaden your horizon about stuff and you know, not really sweat the small stuff too much that makes you different. You want to focus on how you can work together to uh, complete the mission or um, make sure everything runs smoothly. Well said. Spoken like somebody who has certification in human resources. Okay. At at Cornell. (laughs) Tell me about this. So what what are you working on right now? You got your MFA in writing. Mm-hmm. And, and and you're still writing, like you said, you're taking the note notes on everything that we're saying. Yes, uh, yes. But so, what do you what do you want to? What's your vision with this certification at that you're getting from Cornell University? Right, I know it's so amazing. Uh, so I'm getting a human resource uh, certification in management, HR management from Cornell. Um, I started classes last year. I think it was in November. Uh, so I'm getting that, and it's going to help further me and my business. So I own a company called Resume Advantage where we do employment services. Uh, So resumes and cover letters, professional bios. And before our target audience or our main customers were those transitioning out of the military and coming into the civilian sector. Uh, But now it's kind of broadening and anybody that needs a resume, um, you know, doesn't matter where you come from. We've been getting tons of different clients and customers. Uh, But so I'm just making sure I have a certification in that so I can teach individuals what the HR employee or uh, company is looking for on that resume so we can make their resume as effective as possible. And we kind of like guarantee them that interview. Um, And if they do want other resources or other services, like prepping them for the interview, we also do that as well. But I just feel like if I'm able to uh, make myself like a one-stop shop, and also offer workshops as well, just teaching people how to write the resumes and how to communicate your value. Just feel like it, I'd be much more effective to the community that I'm servicing, and um, just makes me feel good knowing that I I know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be selling people uh, any dreams or blowing smoke up their behinds. <laughs> I, I love that, and, and, you know. And so for people, because a lot of people are having to switch career. Right. They've been in Mm -hmm. the same job for 20, 30 years and they they haven't looked at their resume, uh, you know, in all that time. And so is is someone who has been in a career for 20, 30 years and now switching. Is there something they're going to do differently than someone who's fresh out of college? Is their resume going to look a little different? And could you kind of share those details? Oh, yes, of course. So someone who is going to be switching. A, uh, a career. So we'll say that they've worked in the medical field and now they want to do, I don't know, PR work or something. Um, so you're going to definitely, it's going to be a targeted position. So you're going to find the job that you want to apply to. And we're going to uh, accentuate all the aspects and abilities that you can do for that job. So all of the experience that you have that can relate to that new position that you're trying to apply to, we're going to cater it to that specific job. And then somebody who's like a recent graduate or um, a college student, you're going to work on their potential, what they can bring to the table, the value that they would have in in the event that you did hire them. So you want to just focus on um, uh, how uh, like team, uh, not team, but on what is how manageable they are, um, how quickly they learn something, how how well they did on the internship, um, their passion, their drive stuff like that. So it's just going to be a lot different because they don't have much experience versus somebody who has 20 years of experience um, than the other. <clears throat> oh, that, that makes sense. So it sounds like someone who is fresh out of college, we're focusing mm-hmm. on more internal assets. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm motivated. Yes. I'm a go-getter. I'm proactive. I'm a team player, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then for someone who's been in a gig, uh, for 20, 30 years, we're focusing more on the skills that they have that are transferable to the, the right. jobs that they're seeking, right? Mm-hmm. And so there, those, are, those skills are called hard skills. Those skills are the ones that you've learned, that you've studied, that you've like, tan- not tangible, but tangible versus soft skills, which are like in- internal attributes that you can present to the company. So you want to highlight different types of 
skill sets to let them know if this is the individual that you want to hire for your team? Oh, that's uh, I, I would hate to go on a date with you because I, I feel like you know you'd be you'd be reading body language and, and oh my god, I and, I do all yeah, the time. You're scanning I do. for everything, huh? I do, I do, I do. So like when I do um, podcasts with people or I do interviews or whatever it is, you you know you learn their body language, so I can tell if someone's not into what I'm saying or they're not paying attention. So when somebody is, they're like, they'll lean into the conversation. So you see them leaning into the phone or, you know, the Zoom call or whatever, or um, they'll they'll mimic your gestures of what you're doing. So it's just showing them that they're into what you're saying. So I make sure I look and see what they're thinking and like how it's going. And so it helps me pull back or it helps me understand if I'm going on too long about something because it's just, I don't know, just like little cues I need to pick up on. Uh, if I'm drawing out something too much or if I'm uh, if I should focus on this a little bit more to look a little bit more interested, this is where I need to, you know, amp it up a bit. But I definitely do. Even when people are sitting down and they have their feet towards you. Uh, so say like you, uh, you are on a date with somebody. Right. And somebody uh, they're sitting, you guys are sitting in front of each other. If their feet are not in front, like your feet aren't facing each other, that means they're really not into you. <laughs> Oh, it's all about the feet, huh? Well, I don't know if it's all about the feet, but I, you know, I just, I, I read a lot of stuff. So I'm not a psychologist. I don't know. That's just what I've read that, you know, these gestures. I, I've, I've read the same thing. The, the, mm-hmm. the feet, the, the, the hands, the, mm-hmm. the eyes, all, all these things, how, how often they touch you. Um, yes. How, often, how many times they say I versus we versus you, all, all these little mm. subtle See, you know. Uh, I, I I know, but here's we the thing: it's like, the you know, a lot of people got like uh, hip issues too. So sometimes they feet turned a certain way because that's true. They, they got they got a missing adductor or something. You know, you know. Ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> true, 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 true. That's so true. True. Everybody has a specific yeah. certain situation. Yeah, true. it's it's so it's so it's so, but it's it's fun science though because there there is some science to it. They were. Um, there, there was a show talking about lie detector tests and how lie detector tests don't detect lies. They detect tension. So oh. if you're lying about something that you wholeheartedly agree with and align with, like say mm. like, uh, like, you know, if I killed somebody or murdered somebody, I'd feel I'd be racked with guilt versus if I'm a, a US soldier and mm-hmm. I'm I'm you know assassin you know killing someone to save mm-hmm. lives or to protect the country there's going to be zero tension in my body I'm going to be I'm backed by the military I'm backed by the country I'm backed by my family mm-hmm. so it's like if if what you're doing aligns with your values Mm-hmm. And there's going to be zero tension on that lighter. Wow. I didn't know that. I've always wondered how that works, but that makes a lot of sense because your heart is beating really fast. Like, you know, there's more tension. You feel uh, more anxiety about what's going on, you know? So it's like a body reaction. Got it. Makes sense. So Brandy, are there, are there any, are there any blueprints or strategies for people who, are you know struggling with the enemy within or without that we haven't discussed that you'd love to share? Um, I would definitely say don't make any permanent decisions on temporary feelings, circumstances, situations, or events. Uh, you know, the pain is not gonna last forever, and there's no need to do something that's gonna be, um, you know, set yourself up for failure in the future or hinder you some some way. Yeah, because uh, when you were struggling with PTSD, I mean, you're, you're still struggling with it on some level, but when you're at your low of lows, did you think about ending your life? Would that cross your mind? Or? Uh, so I never thought about ending my life with uh, cancer. Like I've had some breakups and I felt extremely, extremely depressed about some stuff and thought about some, um, you know, some crazy unlogical things we'll say uh but for like cancer no i 
nothing for cancer. I, I literally wanted to do everything I could to stay here on this planet. So ending my life for, for having cancer was definitely not anything. However, going through like a really tough breakup had um, produced other um, ideas <laughs> before. So w- why do you, you know, it's fascinating that you say that because I, I've realized that about myself also that, um, you know, I've had uh, spinal surgery and, and what they fuse wow. C3 through five together. Uh, wow. I was paralyzed twice. And in those moments, I've never wanted to fight for my life more. Like, like mm-hmm. I was a the I was a lion. Like I was gonna do mm-hmm. everything I possibly could to get back to uh, where I was, and and there, there was there was gonna be no stopping me. There was nothing but a fierce determination. But you know, if, but if she don't call me back, though. <laughs> <laughs> If 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 she don't return this text, we gonna we gonna have a problem. Right? I'm I'm a loser. Right. Like, I'm gonna be un- I know. Done. It's yeah. fascinating how much relationships are so important to us. Mm-hmm. It's very important. Yes, and it's it was almost like I wanted that individual to feel as hurt as I did. So whatever issues I could bring on them because I was feeling just so depressed and sad. Like I wanted that individual to feel the same way. I'm not happy that you're happy (laughs) and you're okay. And you're, you know, that you're, um, you're right with, you know, moving on. I was like, I, you know, this, this is not fair. This is not fair. So I've had a couple of those incidents uh, going through some tough breakups, but you live and you learn. And did you discuss any of this with your therapist and what were you know, how did they help you navigate uh, those situations? Because, you know, breakups really undo a lot of people. Oh, my God, I know. Uh, so, yeah, I had a couple of different uh, therapy sessions when I was going through one of them. And uh, she would just tell me to, you know, that this hard, these hard times were going to pass. And she would, you know, do the breathing exercise. And I'm like, lady, this is not working. I don't care about the breathing exercise. Like, you know, that's not helping me. I'm still upset. I'm still sad. but she would just talk about focusing on uh, the future and what's what's going to be great when it comes out of this because I wanted to break up with this person. But when it happened, I was so sad and I was depressed and I was just not myself for, you know, like eight, six months. It took a long time. But um, so she kept reminding me, this is what you asked for. Now we have to work through it. You know, um, she was telling me how I need to get rid of things that reminded me of that individual um, you know, don't throw it away, but just take it out of your area that you can see it. So put it in storage somewhere, you know, go pack it up and just know this is a fresh start for yourself and journal, write it down. Why are you really feeling like this? So things like that. And it, and it did help me a lot. I love that. Focus on the future because we get so focused on the present and how we feel right now. And, it, and we catastrophize everything. I'll never find another mm-hmm. love like this in my life. <laughs> i know gosh why are we so dramatic i don't know and but you know it's it's we need people who are dramatic i think it's when we live in such a society where uh stoicism is becoming Mm -hmm. the norm and and good manners we must all uh here here you know right good posture I that, feel like that's that sets us up for failure even more because if you are taught that you can't cry or express yourself or the, your feelings aren't valid, like that just causes even more stress, even more anxiety, even more PTSD. Like we need to be able to communicate how we're feeling in a in like a constructive way. I mean, without that's why feeling I, bad. Exactly because that's why I watch telenovelas because they they mm. throw it all out there. I mean, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I ain't that dramatic. All right, I ain't, I'm good, right. Right. right? You know, but but that's the beauty of it, and 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 the beauty of exploring the world is that we do get to see how other cultures express themselves mm-hmm. emotionally, and it's really about finding the space. And it sounds like you found that in Miramar, where mm. you know. You're like, oh, okay, y'all, y'all express yourselves. Y'all feel me. Y'all, y'all get me. Like, I'm not, I'm not the weird one here. We all on the same page about this, right? Okay. We all want to flip a table over when we break. Okay. Okay. Good. (laughs) 
That's funny. Yeah, I love it here. It's it's great. I love that it's a little bit more open about, I guess, your feelings, you can say. I, I do feel like that is definitely um, something I can see. There are a lot of people who are very expressive and, and we'll say in a, in a good, in a good way. Cause it's, it's, it's a good, it's okay to express yourself and to talk about how you're feeling. So people should Absolutely. honor that, you know, it's a good thing. Well, Brandy Benson, this has been uh, an incredible conversation. I'm so glad that we were able to, to talk and maybe <laughs> at some point we'll be able to meet. I'm always, I do a lot of cruise ships and sometimes I'll fly out of uh, Florida uh, so I'll bring my okay. girl down there. We'll hang out. Yeah, um, let me know. Let you touch up my resume. Yeah, I would love to help you out with the resume. <laughs> I'm telling you that that piece of paper it can it can change your life dramatically. It really can. Absolutely. Tell the people where they can find you. All right, you can find me on my website is www.brandylbenson.com or on my Instagram, which is brandyl.benson. And then last question, and I ask this of all my guests, because I always imagine there's one Mm -hmm. person listening in who may be on the precipice of ending their life. Before you kill yourself, Mm -hmm. what would you say to them, Brandy? I would tell them, that's a really good question. Um, Again, um, make sure that they have reached out to all the individuals that they can um, at that point, I'm pretty sure they do feel very isolated and alone. Uh, and if reaching out to individuals and no one's picking up or whatever the case may be, but also tell them that the pain that they're feeling, it doesn't last forever. Um, so don't make any decision that's going to hinder you or alter you from being the elite version of yourself. Uh, so don't make any permanent decisions or actions off of temporary, again, feeling situations or circumstances because the depression is going to go away. Um, you know, the rain and, and the storms don't last forever. At the end of the day, the sunshine is going to come back out sometime. Ooh, you said elite version of yourself. I, it, I was yes. going to end there, but I have one last question then. Okay. Uh, are there <laughs> books that you read? Uh, or is, there uh, something, is there something that helped you get through the, the storms or something that you're reading now? or? Um, I'm reading a couple of different books right now. So, but they're not like, you know, getting me through anything. I just, I love to learn and I am really fascinated right now about like energy and, um, well, you know, the cosmos and stuff. So I'm reading stuff about quantum physics. So I don't know. <laughs> Wait, all right. So give a me a book different. title. Give me one book title like that, that right. of one that you like. <clears throat> All right. So I'm reading one right now, not the quantum physics. This is not in front of me, but there's one called how to make disease disappear. And uh, that one is about exercising. It's about movement. It's about what you're eating. It's about paying attention to how you're feeling and uh, taking time for yourself. And he also explains that a lot of people have these chronic diseases because they are so stressed out that all of these issues are because of low cortisol. I think it is levels you know, that hormone there, um, it's kind of just been um, uh, misused in a way. And in order to get those levels back up to where they need to be, you have to take time for yourself. You need to be journaling, meditating, doing something for yourself and not always constantly on the move and uh, not really in the present moment. So that's what I'm reading literally next to me. This I book, love How it. to Make I Disease Disappear. Yes. How to Make Disease Disappear. I love it. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help. Call the 1 800 S U I C I D E or 1 800 273 TALK. You can always go to thrivewithleo.com for coaching, one on one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Brandy. Thank you for having me.